Hey everybody, I am here with Tim, and Tim's gonna help me film the pollination stuff. So, Tim, would you like to say anything to anybody? Um, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Tim Jordan, I'm the interpretive specialist here at Kalapapa National Historical Park, and like Joey said, I'm gonna help uh, video him uh, manually pollinating these flowers of the hoava, which is an endangered plant. And uh, we're at Hali Malama, which is the museum curatorial facility, um, and we're in the courtyard where some of the uh, rare and endangered species have been planted so we can monitor them closely. Perfect. Camera. Okay. So, um, first thing that we did was we were looking off the male plant. And like I mentioned earlier, um, Hoavas uh, dioecious. So these are all the female plants. Dioecious means two houses, so male, female. These are the female plants. Um, and right here, these are probably some of the last flowers that this plant's gonna produce. Um, they're really fragrant, and they are kind of like an off-white cream color. Below it, you have some uh, some flowers that, had, that are starting to go to fruit. These flowers have not been pollinated, uh, but the huava will just produce fruit anyways, even though they haven't been pollinated. Um, fruits, like, um, like right here, these plants were pollinated and should produce uh, fertile, fertile fruit. Uh, and they were pollinated on 413. So, let's look at my little pollination box. And, Tim, what's the date? Today um, is Feb, or I'm sorry, May the 2nd. May, so five, two, we have these nice little aluminum tags um, that you can just use the back of a brush to um, write the date, uh, 2014. So that's taken care of, so now I don't have to do that. Um, and here, I'm using a stiff brush um, with like very few bristles because that seems to work better on the huava. There are lots of ways that you can um, hand pollinate plants and other implements work better for other species. Like if I was pollinating like a guava or something and I lived in California, I would be using like a very large paintbrush to kind of dust the pollen around because they're very open pollinated plants. Whereas the huava, kind of a tube and this stiff uh, this stiff brush is able to just be inserted very easily inside and contact the stigma with the um, brush. So we didn't get too much um, pollen from the male which is okay we have enough for about three flowers so I'm just gonna get some pollen on the tip of the brush close it up so the wind doesn't blow it away and then just take the pollen and put it on the stigma as best as I can. Um, there we go. There's one flower done. I'm trying to be very conservative because I want to make sure that these flowers actually get the pollen on the stigma. And some of these stigmas are really deep, um, while some of them are not, are a little bit more shallow and are able to make contact a lot easier. So, the stigma is right here in the center of the flower and it's really sticky, which means that it's receptive. So we can get some pollen grains right on that. And within the next couple hours, the pollen is gonna start producing a pollen tube to fertilize the ovaries in the, uh, in the, base of the plant. And I'm just hitting them a second time just to make sure that we have um, enough coverage of pollen because the more pollen grains that we put on the stigmatic surface, the more successful the pollination is going to be and the more seeds that the plant is likely to produce. Um, so looks like we are about out of pollen and I'm going to see if there are any more flowers around that we might be able to hit because these two are pretty good. I don't see I don't see anything, so we'll just put them one more time with the remaining pollen. And um I'll 
ta-da, we've just pollinated a uh, critically endangered species. So now take our tag. And these are really nice because you can come, you can actually see them over on that bush from here. Um, you can see the silver um, just kind of like catching the sun. So it's really easy to see where you, um, where you hand pollinated. And then you just twist, twist the tag on and bend it over. And now is it really visible and we can see things. I want to show you this. Here's a fruit, it's kind of like an obscene looking thing. But it's really cool. I don't know um, if this one is quite ready to open. But they're really they're really tough and kind of like leathery. And you can hear them pop. And then when you open oh cool. So this one that's actually really awesome. Um, so this one has little black seeds in it because occasionally the huava does not produce, or the, occasionally the huava will produce um, female and male parts that are both uh, that are both functional, and it'll self-pollinate. So all these seeds are have been that have been like self. So there's, selfing is a really, it, it's a really cool strategy because um, when plants self, it means that they're kind of preser preserving their local adaptation. It's not a really great thing. Sometimes people look at it as like an evolutionary dead end because you're not getting a mix of genes. But this is really cool. So now I have seeds to take back into the, into the office. Uh, but they're primarily bird dispersed. Like, like humans, birds also have color vision, so um, when this dehisses and opens up, there are a bunch of red seeds and um, the orange pulp. So the all orange pulp signals to the birds like, hey, we have some flowers, or we have some fruit over here, and then they come and eat the seeds and then fly around and poop the seeds out, and that's how huava gets dispersed. So that's really cool. And notice the size of this. I just picked this because it was just big and I thought it would be easier to handle. So I'll just set these on the ground right here. Um, and this one looks a little smaller. So we'll see. The smaller ones are also harder to open. So you can hear it pop. And see, this one's empty. So this is one that just committed to setting fruit without being pollinated, which is fine, but there's also another very large one here. Maybe we'll get lucky with seeds. And this one's a little bit larger, but nothing. So that's... How many of them produce seeds, typically? Um, well, last time we were here, we found about eight fruits that, um, that produce seeds. This time we found this one. So it's not, it's not like a super common occurrence, but it happens. And so of all the seeds you gather, how many of them are likely to sprout and survive into maturity? Now you're asking too many questions. This is like a really rare um, species, so I don't think anybody has any good number on that. Like, I'm sure the pet people probably know like what the recruitment rate is. But usually, usually plants in nature, like, they set out tons of seeds in hopes that just one will take. So I, I don't know. It's not a question that I can really answer right now. Sure. And do you know how many of these particular plants are in existence or on the peninsula? I or? have no idea. I only know of a few plants that are here. There are probably other plants um, at other places on other islands that are like well protected. Um, Have it. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joey, for all your hard work, and hopefully this plant will bounce back in the nearer future.